Hey guys there, Softtech here and welcome back. Today we'll be doing another round of Tech Talk Q&A, so let's not waste any time at all and let's hop straight into the questions. Yoan Filipov asks, how should one go about aligning the nozzle to the hop-up unit and how to avoid air leaks between those two components? So this is a fairly common issue that a lot of people run into when they're doing high-speed builds. Uh, a lot of newer techs kind of have trouble with this one because it's not something that they think about running into uh, and, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but the issue, the easiest way to explain the issue to people that are having trouble visualizing what the question is asking is that what the question is asking is sometimes whenever you get a upgrade gearbox shell into a body that it is not necessarily belong into, example, Lone X in a GMP shell, then what tends to happen is you have these minor spec issues. And so sometimes you lock down your gearbox shell in the receiver and you notice that your gearbox shell is kind of canted ever so slightly by like 10 degrees up. And so this causes some hop up to air nozzle alignment issues. Your air nozzle won't reset properly. Sometimes you won't even feed correctly. You'll definitely lose some FPS and definitely have some FPS consistency. One shot might be 340, the next might be 380. And so it's a really annoying issue and it's fairly easy to correct though, so try not to worry too much about it. Uh, the simplest way to correct it is to kind of notice where the source of the problem is. And 99.9% .9 of the time, the gearbox shell is canted upward. So the best way to fix this is to use small little washers or shims that you can get at your local hardware store. Putting it between the gearbox shell and the rear of the receiver here through the buffer tube screw between the gearbox shell and the receiver here. And that kind of realigns your gearbox shell to be straight, you know, 180 degrees right here, as opposed to that like, you know, 190 or whatever you want to call it. Um, but, but yeah, uh, that's pretty much the easiest way to fix it. You just got to kind of tighten your buffer tube screw down and get the right amount of shims there. It might require one or two of these thin shims. Usually it only requires one and it's fairly easy to do and that should solve your problem. Martin O'Lill asks, what would you consider to be the minimum viable MOSFET set up on the market today? Thinking mostly of pre-built units. Since we're speaking in terms of literally minimum, um, I think the minimum thing I'd expect in a MOSFET for a pre-built gun would be something like what Crytac has, where it's just a simple MOSFET that just protects your trigger contacts, and that's it. And uh, a plus if it's inside the gearbox show, like Crytax as well. I feel like that should be the industry standard as of now. Now, if we want to go a step further, something like a simplified, you know, gate Titan MOSFET, where it's just a digital trigger, and all it does is protect, you know, all it does is allow you to run high voltage LiPos and high discharge LiPos and all that stuff. I think that's fine as well. That's probably obviously going to be a little more expensive than a simple MOSFET like Crytac has, but minimal requirement I think would be like a 3034 based MOSFET that's pre-built inside the gearbox shell. And all it does is protect your trigger contacts because that's all it needs to do and people would be totally happy with that. Reckless ARS 7 asks, can you give a brief explanation or your opinion on the gate Aster? Is it good for the price and is it as good as everyone says it is? So based upon my personal experience alone, I can't really recommend the Gate Aster MOSFET. I had a customer send me his Crytac LMG that he had worked on by a previous tech, and they had installed the Gate Aster MOSFET. And when I got the gun in, I couldn't get it to cycle at all when I received it. And so I took it apart and I determined it was the MOSFET. And uh, I took that MOSFET out, I tried to clean it up a lot, and then sometimes some grease gets on those sensors and just won't quite cycle right or won't quite detect things well. So cleaned it up, put it back in the gearbox shell, still couldn't get it to cycle, still couldn't get it to uh, detect the trigger, nothing would work on it. And so I just kind of tossed it out and uh, put a gate Titan in there. And I don't really think it has anything to do with gate itself. I think their MOSFETs are fairly good. I love their Titan. I honestly like it a little more than the BTC Spectre MOSFET and Chimera, just my personal experience there. And so can't really recommend the gate Aster at this time. I had to reach out to a couple people that I know who had more experience with them than I did, and all of them said that they wouldn't really recommend it either. And so at this time, I think it's no-go with that MOSFET. What gear set, motor, and battery combos will encounter premature engagement? Also, if I don't have a Dremel, would I still be able to file off teeth from a piston metal rack or a sector gear with a metal file, albeit taking a lot of time? Thank you. So premature engagement it is actually quite a bit more than just your gears and motor and battery and spring. It's it's quite a lot of other factors, even with tuning. But if we're just talking like 
build setup, what would what would you hit PME with premature engagement? You'd hit it with like a Lone XA2 or SHS high torque motor, 12 to one or 13 to one gears, uh, M90 spring, and like a heavy piston, like an aluminum piston and 11.1 volt LiPo. You'd absolutely hit premature engagement and you'd either destroy your piston or your sector gear, one of the two, more than likely your piston because that's usually what goes first over the sector gear. Um, now, if we're talking like minimum requirements to not hit premature engagement, in my experience, the minimum thing is like an M110 spring. If you have like a 13 to one or 12 to one gear set up with like a high speed or high torque motor like SHS or Lone XA2 or even the ZCI uh, balanced motor, for example, um, if you have an 11.1 volt LiPo kind of matched with all that, you should probably have at minimum an M110 spring and short stroke down to what you want. Now. You can go with an M110, but I prefer M120, M130, just because you can short stroke to your desired level. Um, short stroking in this case will actually help you out, avoid premature engagement, because it makes the sector gear shorter in terms of the teeth on the sector portion of that gear. And so if you take away teeth, your chances of hitting premature engagement have gone down, and you're, lower, and you're lowering your joule and FPS output to the point where you actually want it. It's the whole point of short stroking. Um, for the second part of the question, how could you go about short stroking? You really should have a Dremel. Technically, it's possible to short stroke with just a file, but you're going to be there an awfully long time. If you absolutely have to use a file and you do not want to spend the $35 on a nice Dremel, then you can just short stroke the sector gear. You can get away with not short stroking the piston because your sector gear is going to release wherever your sector gear releases, and that's not going to be a problem at all. Um, but you should probably do both if your whole point of the speed build is to avoid premature engagement. Lightening the load of the piston will help your piston return to the front more quickly so that you don't hit premature engagement or your chance of hitting premature engagement is lower. Alright guys, that's all the time I have today for questions. I do want to move on to giving a shout out to Gale Force Airsoft and G-Tech Industries. In my last Airsoft Tech Talk Q&A video, I asked for people to send me videos of their work if they needed help getting their name out there in the community. And Gale Force Airsoft, or G-Tech Industries, shot me an email and asked for a shout out. And so I went through the line of asking for some of his builds to see if he was a reputable tech, and he seems to be quite knowledgeable and reputable. There'll be a couple videos here of his builds going, and uh, you can kind of see that they're fairly cool, and well, fairly cool, really, really cool, actually. And so if you guys want any tech work done, and you don't want to go through me or if I'm too busy and you want to go through somebody else, he seems to be quite the reputable tech. I do know that he is in Canada. So if you're going from North America or America to Canada, you might not want to do that whole shipping problem there with, between the two nations. But if you're in Canada, definitely check him out. All right, guys, that's going to have to do it for this video. If you have any comments or any questions or you want to have your question on the next episode of Airsoft Tech Talk Q&A, drop it below. And if you see a question you like, like it and try to bump it up to the top so that I'll see it and understand that it's popular enough to warrant a response. And as usual, please like this video, share it with your friends, and if you haven't already, subscribe so you can see further videos. All right, guys, I'll see you in the next video. But remember, stay tuned, Tex. Thank you.